is uh, uh, Mira Todorova. Are you there? Yeah, Laura, can you unshare? So uh, yes, I, I was trying to, to, you know, to get um, the, the other pointer because I cannot move with this. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, <laughs> Okay, Mira, uh, Mira uh, uh, Todorova uh, works uh, at the uh, Max, uh, Max Planck Institute uh, in uh, Dusseldorf. Uh, she uh, starts from a background in uh, semiconductor physics uh, and uh, exporting, uh, extending concepts from uh, defect semiconductor physics uh, to electrochemistry has become an uh, authoritative voice in uh, the electrochemical, uh, computational electrochemistry community. And uh, today she is going to talk about something uh, very interesting, a uh, potentiostat and thermo thermopotentiostat, if it is uh, the correct way of defining it. And I'm very, and I think that uh, the audience will be very interested uh, in understanding what uh, she can achieve uh, with this. And she, what she, uh, she understood using this uh, uh, Develop, uh, the methodology, and in particular, the title of her talk uh, is. Uh, uh, I, I hope it's the same as the. Uh, it's. Uh, I cannot see all the all the presentation. It's. Uh, oh, okay, uh, you can't. <laughs> I, <laughs> I I just think can see just uh, um, uh, like the um, top uh, right angle of it. Anyway, oh, the title is for everybody the same. So do I. Uh, no, okay, it's sorry. Uh, we can it's okay. see the full, full screen. Okay, great, Good. sorry. Okay, the title is uh, Hydrogen and Electrified Solid Liquid Interfaces Inside from uh, Ab Initio Molecular Dynamic Simulations. So, thank you very much, uh, Clotilde, and thank you also for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about our work at this uh, very interesting uh, symposium. Unfortunately, not in person, but uh, at least we can stay connected online. And uh, so we have heard a lot about solid liquid interfaces and I don't have to convince you that they are ubiquitous and important in many processes of practical importance. And this is just a very small selection. And typically what we see is like, for example, in the case of corrosion that the um, what comes out due to these processes at solid liquid interface is something that we see on a macroscopic scale. But of course, we, they are initiated at the microscopic scale and we need to understand what is going on there, the making and breaking of bonds. And uh, zooming in into the microscopic scale, this is by no means simple. I mean, even if we look just as a metal interface kind of in this kind of cartoon picture taken from the Wikipedia, which comes into contact with, um, uh, with a aqueous environment, um, we have a very complicated situation and a potential drop that uh, is due to the rearrangement of the ions and the differences in uh, surface potentials between these two condensed phases, which can extend to several uh, 100 nanometers actually depending on how dilute the solution is. And uh, describing something like this with DFT, which is uh, for us the matter of method of choice, since we can look really at the electronic structure making and breaking of bonds is um, very challenging. And uh, we can actually only look even in such a simplified uh, microscopic view only at small parts of this interface. And uh, <laughs> make sure that we are all kind of on the same page about what I'm talking. So this would be kind of the zoom in in this interface. And typically, if we don't have specific assumption due to just the um, arrangement of the water molecules at the surface, we will have a potential of zero charge. And uh, as it, uh, conditions can change, there may be a re rearrangement of the electrons, but also in experiment, actually one of the kind of things that uh, allows us to control what is happening at the interface is applying a bias. And applying such a bias will um, lead to rearrangements of the uh, ions at the interface. There may be specific absorption. Uh, some ions may be actually pushed away because, um, or move further into the solution because of the charging of the electrode. And this process can continue. At some point, uh, the um, Surface, uh, so basically specifically absorbed ions will no longer be able to sustain the electrode potential and as we increase the potential, the um, 
ions which are closer to the surface become important in kind of screening a big charge of the electric field that develops there. At some point, even this will not be solution, uh, sufficient and we start to drive electrochemical reactions. And what we would like to have in uh, actually DFT calculation is something where we have a kind of a reference electrode which will allow us to uh, control the excess charge and account actually for also for non this non-neutral diffusive layer. And um, I will talk about how we realize such a setup which allows us actually to charge also the electrode interface and look at uh, what is happening under applied voltage. But um, first, uh, and I will also talk about geometry that we use. Uh, this is kind of shown here. We have usually uh, a working electrode. We have a kind of a reference electrode. We have water in between, um, and uh, we may apply or may not apply voltage. And this allows us to look at reactions at solid liquid interface. For example, one of the most fundamental reactions in terms of uh, corrosion, which is the dissolution of a metal. Um, but today I would like to focus more on the interaction of hydrogen, water and metal interfaces and would like particularly to talk about two systems. One is the <clears throat> hydrogen platinum 111 water interface, which Marcella also talked about. And uh, then I would like also to talk about the interaction of hydrogen of hydrogen evolution at a nautically polarized magnesium. I would also discuss a little bit how we achieve the potential control in the density, periodic density functional theory code. And before I continue, I would like to particularly acknowledge Sudarshan Surendralal, who was a PhD student and is now a postdoc in my group and who um, obtained most of the results that I will be presenting today. So let us start with the platinum electrode uh, water system. This is a very nice model system. It is uh, of industrial relevance, uh, for example, for hydrogen evolution, but it is also experimentally and theoretically probably one of the most studied electrochemical systems. So there is a lot of information there. And in this way, it is also something where one can nice, uh, which one can nicely use when uh, also uh, testing methodologies. And um, um, here, um, one of the experiments we would like to look at is, for example, a cyclical camogram, which provides direct information about the hydrogen coverage and the electrode potential. And you can see such a, a, a full camogram here. <clears throat> you don't have to understand everything about it. I, this was already also shown in previous talk. What is interesting that in this case we have, uh, in this region we have a uh, surface which is just in contact with uh, the aqueous environment, so not, no specific absorption. And when we go along this branch, we have hydrogen absorption. <clears throat> along this branch, we have hydrogen desorption. Um, and these are very reversible. And interesting is also that one can achieve a maximal coverage of about 0.66 monolayers, after which hydrogen starts to evolve. Um, <clears throat> In, uh, this surface has been also studied in more surface science kind of approaches with neglecting the aqueous solution, but uh, they have failed to explain this um, kind of critical coverage after which the, surf, uh, the hydrogen starts to evolve. Uh, we wanted to understand better what is going on there and looked at this interface. First, uh, looking at a kind of uh, ignoring the water and just looking at a surface science setup in which we have the surface in vacuum and we absorb progressively more hydrogen on the surface. Uh, and, uh, what deter and look at the work function change. We reference it always to the uh, work function of the clean platinum surface here. And what determines this change is the surface dipole of the, at the interface, which comes through the absorption of the ions. And what we can see is that it progressively changes in a monotonous way. Now, when we put in, in the same plot, the data obtained for the, from the cyclic voltammogram, we see that we seem to have kind of a similar dependence on the, um, like we observed in the surface science case, which can be seen if we shift the data. Uh, which uh, kind of indicates that 
even if we look at this dependence of the work function on increasing hydrogen coverage, we can describe the situation also in uh, if we neglect water. So maybe water is kind of just a spectator which is responsible for maybe <clears throat> the shift that we see between the bulk, the, uh, the surf, uh, vacuum uh, calculations um, and uh, when we perform DFT calculation for the solid liquid interface are also similar between the experiments. Uh, however, what about this critical coverage? To understand this, we, as I said, we carried out uh, calculations in which we consider the platinum uh, electrode in, con uh, in contact with water. Uh, and performed uh, molecular dynamic simulations with, uh, for the clean surface and then with increasing hydrogen coverage. And we see that up to approximately half a monolayer, we kind of follow the experimental curve. And here within this region, something seems to happen. So there is a change in the behavior and actually close to one monolayer, we are very close to the value that we obtain for the vacuum situation. <clears throat> um, what Trying to analyze this better, we kind of see that apparently there is an initial shift which will correspond to the potential of zero charge because here we don't have any adsorbates on the surface. So this is determined only by the water. As we start absorbing hydrogen on the surface, there is a further shift in the chemical potential, uh, sorry, in the electrode potential. And this can be kind of sustained so the, by the specific absorption about in our calculation to about half a monolayer in experiment a little bit further. But it seems that if the potential is increased further, there is no possibility to increase the hydrogen coverage. This is also what we see in the simulation because we find that these structures here that we initially see are only metastable. For example, for the one monolayer coverage case, after about 20 uh, picoseconds, we see that there is a desorption um, mechanism, so a hydrogen used the solution as a for, forming a hydronium ion. And in this way, the increase is, it um, allows for a bigger surface dipole, which can uh, sustain this applied voltage. <clears throat> now, um, in order to understand what is going on, we decompose the electrode potential into various parts. So the first part is um, basically due to hydrogen interactions with the surface hydrogen absorption. And this is a contribution that we also know from, um, which is also present in a surface science kind of experiment. Indeed, if we put kind of this contribution that we calculated from our MD calculations, we see that it very nicely follows the situation that we have in vacuum. There are, however, other contributions which are due to the presence of water. One contribution which is due to the orientation of the water molecule and one which is due to um, uh, interactions um, with the, of the water with the surface. This may be electron transfer or polarization, so anything that happens close to the surface in this aspect. If we analyze this contribution, we see that there is kind of a phase transition in between. So up to approximately half a monolayer, um, the contribution for this electronic water contribution and orientation have, um, are opposite, but approximately behaving in the same way. So um, they largely cancel uh, each other and basically just result in a shift of this value. We also see that this um, chemisorbed water induces, so each of these chemisorbed water molecule in, molecules induces an almost constant dipole moment independent of the coverage, um, uh, independent of the coverage. When we start to increase the hydrogen coverage and go actually to one monolayer, we see that the number of chemisorbed water molecules decreases, first of all. And we also see that the orientation, reorientation of the water doesn't seem to be able to compensate for the electronic effects that are present at the interface, which explains why we have very different um, behavior in the electrode potential work function when we go to higher coverages. Taking a somewhat a closer look, um, so what happens is basically that the high coverage, the water impact dem dominates. And uh, we wanted to understand better this core absorption. So what is the 
uh, scammy soft water doing. And uh, for this uh, reason, we took a closer look, uh, looking at the charge density different plots uh, for the various coverages. What you see here is kind of a side view of a water molecule and the platinum atom below it with the respective orbitals. And this very much resembles the view, the picture that is known and well established that the platinum D band interacts with the uh, lone pair um, uh, one B one orbital of the water, forming a bonding and an antibonding set state. And conventionally, it is assumed that the Fermi energy of the metal is below this antibonding state, and there is a charge transfer from the water molecules to the surface, making the water molecule slightly positively charged, while the metal atom below it is negatively charged. We looked at the charge actually on this. Um, um, atoms and we found something which for us was surprising that actually also the uh, platinum atom has a positive charge and uh, the charge um, from the water from this kind of water platinum um, complex is transferred to neighboring platinum uh, atoms and uh, when we look at the basically the charge kind of uh, is um, yeah compensating each other. But having this kind of mechanism so that water transfers charge also to neighboring platinum uh, atoms means that uh, each water molecule that is chemisorbed requires a much larger surface area. And this reduces the number of uh, possible or available absorption sites. When, when we start to get higher amounts of hydrogen on the surface, in fact, water and the hydrogen start to compete for the platinum atoms. And in this way, we see at higher, uh, at higher coverages, less and less hydrogen, uh, sorry, water can be soaked at the surface. Um, and what is also interesting, we find that the, um, the antibonding level of the conduction uh, of the chemical water molecules is actually pinned to the metal's Fermi level, which means that uh, uh, homo of this chemical water molecule is partially occupied and this be, uh, molecule becomes metallic, which means that it has very different properties in terms of screening. So we kind of uh, revised the model for the absorption of the water on the surface uh, of platinum saying that it doesn't require just, uh, it's not only an interaction with the platinum atom, it is sitting directly above, but also uh, interacts with the neighboring platinum atoms. Um, now, how do we perform the calculations? This was a calculation in which we did not apply uh, explicitly um, a bias voltage, even though we made a relation to the uh, voltage. Um, uh, in order to um, now apply the, though the setup that we used was the same, like <clears throat> as in the calculations, <clears throat> excuse me, that I will show now. Um, we want to design so the question is, how do we design this reference electrode in order to apply also an electrode charge? Uh, we want to have a reference electrode that must donate or accept fractional electron charges to the electrode in order to be able to charge it. And ideally, it we would be able to couple it with the potentiostat. It will have a small surface dipole and will be inert to surface absorptions and reactions so that it is just a computational tool that we use, but it's not something that is interfering with what we want to observe, which is the solid liquid interface at the working electrode. Now, um, what we want to do, in other words, we want to have a working electrode, we want to have a reference electrode, which would supply charging, uh, which will uh, play a role in charging the uh, metal surface um, and uh, th thereby uh, guaranteeing that we have the uh, electric field to the cell. The challenge is that typically we are working with periodic boundary conditions code, and this uh, requires that we have the same potential on both sides of the supercell. But this is something we can deal with by using the dipole corrections, which has been known for a long time. The second difficulty is we face that there is a mandatory condition for a constant Fermi level throughout the cell in any DFT code, which means that after our SCF cycle has run, we have one Fermi energy throughout the cell. 
For this reason, we faced some difficulties uh, when we wanted to use a metal reference electrode and then asked ourselves, can't we use a semiconductor concepts to tune the Fermi level since after all, this is the daily bread of uh, semiconductor physics. <clears throat> so then we turned to looking at reference electrodes uh, by using materials with the gap. The requirements that uh, then we can, for example, consider p-type doping and uh, because of the equilibration of the Fermi energy, we will have electrons transfer from the metal to the reference electrode and thereby uh, have an electric field to our cell. What are the requirements that we have uh, towards this reference electrode, um, semiconducting reference electrode? It, will, it should be a material which has a very large band gap. And we know that DFT is notorious in underestimating the band gaps. Um, so um, on the other hand, we also have uh, our unit, uh, our cell, supercell, in which we have two electrodes. So we have to match it, met, lattice match them, which means that if we deform the lattice constant of a material, of our semiconducting material, this will further uh, usually reduce the band gap. So we want something that has a small deformation potential. And as already mentioned, it should be inert to possible reactions with, this, with the solvent. It should also have a band gap, which is aligned uh, such that it straddles the band gap of water so that we can, re it is, we can really concentrate on what is happening at this interface. And it turned out to our surprise that neon was the best choice as that we could take because it is a um, material which is uh, van der Waals bonded. So it has a very small deformation potential and also uh, fulfills all the additional requirements. Initially, uh, so having found the material, we can now set up our supercell, which typically was, looks like shown here. So we have a working electrode, we have a uh, neon electrode, which is just a computational counter electrode. We sandwich water in between, then we have a vacuum region, uh, which allows us to apply the dipole correction and to ensure a flat band potential within this region. This has also uh, the charm that we can really immediately uh, identify what is the applied bias. Charging is achieved by using the concept of pseudo atoms, uh, which means that we have neutral objects since we change both the valence and the conduction uh, and the electron charge, um, but we have also a charge transfer. So overall, our cell remains neutral, but we are able to charge the working electrode. And uh, this setup is extremely attractive to us because it is easily used in any standard DFT code. Uh, it works uh, for semiconducting and metallic electrodes and uh, allows us direct access to the applied bias voltage and the electrode charge. Um, in our first uh, attempt, we coupled it by a, a, with a potentiostat, or we built up a potentiostat by an external loop by monitoring the charge, uh, the, sorry, the potential drop at the interface, and then uh, comparing it to, to um, our target voltage. This was a situation where we didn't uh, modify the DFT code, uh, but we also didn't have an explicit coupling between the thermostat and the potentiostat, uh, which is desirable because uh, if we have this coupling, we can actually thermostat our system using the potentiostat and ensure that we do not have any um, cooling of the system if the correct modes aren't um, uh, our aren't um, receiving charge that has been, uh, sorry, uh, energy that has been dissipated. And so in the term, newly developed thermopotential start approach, we derive the electrode charge from the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And the dissipation term is uh, similar to, uh, is basically an Ohm's law uh, directed term. And this drives the system when it is uh, far from, from the targeted um, uh, potential. Uh, till it achieves it uh, or it gets clear and close to thermal equilibrium, the fluctuation term ensures, um, sorry, to when we are close to the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, the fluctuation term ensures that we sample the canonical system correctly. 
So uh, solving such a stochastic differential equation required iter calculus, uh, but in the end, a uh, very simple equation came out, which is easily implemented in a DFT code, and also the quantities are um, obtainable from DFT. In the context of the Apinizio thermal potentials that I would like particularly to mention Stefan Wippermann, who was really instrumental in the, all the derivations and we had, uh, and also coming up with some ideas. And Florian Dysonbeck, who is a PhD student in his group and actually did all the tests and the implementations. And we have uh, this thermal potentials that now are working both in VASP and in LEMS, which allows us to use it both with uh, kind of classical uh, force fields, for example, and also with DFT calculations. And now I would like to discuss a um, case where we actually look at what happens at the surface when we apply a potential and uh, would like to focus on the corrosion of magnesium. Uh, magnesium and its alloys are very interesting for structural implications, for batteries, also for medical applications. Uh, but uh, there is a very big problem with <laughs> in all of this uh, in this context because magnesium has a low corrosion resistance. In fact, this is the element which is most susceptible to galvanic corrosion as one can see here in the table. So it's kind of the most corrosive element. Um, what is very interesting in the context of magnesium corrosion is that it has a kind of unexpected behavior. As, the, as uh, more and more anodic potentials are applied in principle, one would expect that hydrogen evolution uh, is uh, disappearing, but uh, what is seen in uh, magnesium is that there is, it actually starts to increase. And this goes hand in hand with a very high corrosion rate, so dissolution of magnesium. And uh, you can see that the uh, reaction is kind of violent. This uh, phenomenon has been first reported in more than 150 years ago, and uh, the atomistic uh, mechanism was not really understood. And this effect is often referred to anomalous hydrogen evolution or negative difference effects. So for anodic condition, just <laughs> for the non-electrochemist, I would say then this means that the metal surface is basically electron deficient, so positively charged. This is something we wanted to look at and uh, performed a DFT calculation. So here you can see some details of the setup and applied voltage in order to ensure that the metal, magnesium metal is uh, anodically charged. Here, first of all, we performed uh, calculations for open circuit condition, which means we do not apply any voltage and uh, looked at the um, evolution uh, of the species as, uh, as a function of time as perpendicular to the surface normal. What we have blended out is the trajectories of water and magnesium, which are kind of just spectators and not really important or involved in the process. And we only explicitly show trajectories where something is happening. Uh, we can see, so you can also see it in the movie that uh, we have um, dissociation of water close to the surface. Here is an event, then hydrogen can absorb on the surface. It can also penetrate into the surface and we have um, OH absorption on the surface. Uh, monitoring the system, we can reach um, maximum hydrogen OH coverage one third monolayer, which is consistent with what is found in the literature from um, thermodynamic considerations. But uh, we do not see any hydrogen evolution event uh, within the time sc scales that we can sample. Then uh, we applied actually an uh, anodic polarization potentials. Um, here we have blended out all the water molecules that are not participating in the reaction in order to be able to focus on where something is happening. We see if we look at the same plot that uh, Actually, more, many more things are happening. We do still have water dissociation and OH absorption on the surface or hydrogen penetration or absorption uh, at the um, surface. We also see that some of the hydrogens uh, move as uh, hydronium or um, ions, so kind of via a 
hopping mechanism to the other side uh, in order to screen some of the electrode charge. And most interesting for us was that we did see several events in which hydrogen um, formed, so we saw hydrogen evolution. When I think about having the DFT calculations, uh, as I don't have to convince you, I'm pretty sure, is that we can actually look at what is happening. This is here shown in this uh, several uh, snapshots. So we do have a water molecule which interacts with the hydrogen on the surface, forming a hydrogen molecule. And in principle, such a mechanism of uh, water um, interacting with an absorbed hydrogen to form hydrogen uh, gas is known. But this is um, the so-called Kierowski mechanism, but this is a mechanism that is usually observed for cathodic polarization because it requires the consumption of an electron. And please remember we are here at the electron deficient conditions. So um, we uh, analyzed the electronic structure and we find, found actually that the absorbed hydrogen is negatively charged. So we kind of propose a uh, modified Kierowski mechanism in which um, negatively adsorbed hydrogen uh, interacts with the water to form a uh, hydrogen molecule and OH, which eventually also may adsorb on the surface. And so this uh, charge state of the hydrogen adsorbent is really um, crucial um, to have this reaction. I mean, even looking here, um, it is unusual that the hydrogen of a water molecule would uh, react with the hydrogen at the surface unless this one was negative. And this is due to the somewhat peculiar surface properties of magnesium, which having a very uh, large spill out density and ext being extremely polarizable. And with this, um, I would uh, come to the conclusion. So uh, I hope I was able to show you that advanced method uh, allow provide a new level of realism to describe double layer and electrochemical processes and really look at what is going on. And we, um, using this fully uh, par parameter-free um, calculations, we can uh, quantitatively predict the electrode potential for adsorbate covered species. And uh, this enabled us to really look at the role of water coadsorption at the surface and uh, how it plays a role in, um, uh, you know, uh, governing this maximal hydrogen coverage that is is observed in experiment. And we propose a revised metal hydrogen bond model for this system. And uh, of course, when we apply a potential, we can also look at reactions that were so far unclear how they are going on and trying to figure out what the mechanisms are that are going on. Um, if you want to know more about this, this is the work I have talked about has been uh, published in this paper. And uh, in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention and also thank the people um, who were involved in this work. So for that, Sean, I mentioned Jörg, also, Jörg Neugebauer, uh, who is the director of our um, department and uh, very much involved also in discussions. Uh, Stefan and Florian and Christoph, we are, uh, Stefan and Christoph and I are having very often discussions about various parts um, of uh, solid liquid interfaces and uh, Mike was involved in the work on magnesium, and I would like also to particularly acknowledge him. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mira, for the very clear uh, and interesting talk. Um, questions? Is there any question? Uh, Karen, yes, sure. Thank, thank you, Mira, for that really interesting talk. I just have one clarification question about the first part, which was really, really interesting about the effects of water. So from the CV, you have, a real, so from the cyclic botanogram, you have a relationship between potential and coverage. But in your simulations, you're, you're setting a coverage and looking at how the potential varies, right? So, so at the yes. end, with the results consistent, with, with what you expect experimentally? Uh, yes, it is consistent. Ah, okay. So in principle, um, so we are also thinking about, about doing this really with applied potential in particular in this 
region because here the dynamics are extremely, so it really is very slow. And we could see this desorption mechanism at the, you know, one monolayer coverage case in this region, even getting, you know, we didn't, we see that the potential still changes, but it is extremely slow. So we think that if we actively apply a potential, we will be able to maybe even within the time scale of our simulation, be able to get here a better description in the critical regime. But uh, I do not expect to see any changes in uh, within this regime here, for example. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Is there any other question? Actually, Mira, uh, um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, how the potential that behaves when uh, there is a charge transfer reaction at the interface. Because uh, I, mm -hmm. I'm sure that uh, yeah. you can have a charged electrode because there is a difference. Yeah. But then when the charge of the electrode changes, where does yeah. this charge do you expect to go? I mean, so what uh, I mean, uh, let me go to the picture with the neon. Energy. Yes. So, um, OK, what happens is basically discharge here is adapted depending. So if we observe a charge transfer reaction or the charge changes in some way, if there's desorption or whatever, the electrode, so this kind of potential drop will change. This will be reflected here. And we um, now previously we did a few steps and then looked at the average potential and compared it to our targeted quantity. And then depending on in which direction this difference was going, we would either remove or add a little bit charge on this uh, kind of adapt the charge on the pseudo atom. Now with the novel, uh, with the new approach, we can actually do it in the on the fly and we okay. can in every step immediately monitor and re kind of adapt the charge to reflect changes in this, uh, yeah, uh, kind of <laughs> with respect to our targeted quantity. And we really, I mean, you get all the fluctuations. So instantaneously, of course, you have fluctuations. On average, you have the, um, the correct value. But this is also what is kind of, um, I mean, in a thermostat, if you think about it, that's kind of the analogon. Of course, you have thermal fluctuations, but on average, you have kind of a temperature that is constant. And this is exactly what we achieve here. Thank you, Atasperi. Is there any other question? Uh, actually, I mean, uh, uh, you have, we have still a couple of minutes. I, I, I ask, I have another question. At, uh, I mean, uh, I, uh, I'd like uh, um, can you explain how 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 you assign an absolute scale to your <laughs> electrode? So I would say we are not quite there yet because um, at the moment, so yeah, we have a long range behavior, let's say, and at the moment the neon electrode is not yet in the in the position. Uh, because we can't make our chart so big that we are in the range where it is completely flat the potential. So we, uh, if I may, can I actually draw something? <laughs> Maybe I can uh, show a little bit. Uh, so basically we have here the potential and it will kind of flatten off somewhere in the bulk region. And we have our neon electrode somewhere because, you know, depending how big our cell can be. If we have a high concentration, we are probably in a regime where we are here completely flat. If not, uh, there is still kind of a, uh, amount of electrode potential we cannot exactly account for because we kind of interrupted here and this is the difference. So we are currently look, working exactly on this to make an absolute, uh, to be able to absolutely align the potential and be able in this way com to compare to experiment. I would say at the moment we capture most of the potential drop at the interface because most of it falls off, you know, very rapidly close to the interface, but if I had to compare it directly to experiment, I think that uh, we are not quite yet there. So let's say that you have a concentration of ions so high that uh, you get to that. So you are uh, essentially um, uh, saying that the vacuum in front of your uh, neon 
and neon is uh, um, essentially the same as the vacuum in front of the surface of the water of the solvent. What do you mean the vacuum in front of the solvent? So you mean if I have a real uh, surface, uh, real kind I'm of thinking big enough cell? That, sorry? Big enough uh, cell. Yeah, I'm thinking about the uh, Trasatti definition of absolute yeah. potential, where the yeah. reference is the vacuum in mm -hmm. front of the solvent. Mm -hmm. And so, and uh, and I, if I understand correctly, you use a, a vacuum level, which is not exactly in front of the solvent. I guess that if the polarization of the surface is small, it's uh, exact, but I would like to understand a bit better this point. Yeah. So from you. That so we still don't have, let's say the whole drop of the double layer yet. Yeah, we anyway, but uh, let's yes. say that we that you have yes, it. Yeah. It is, I would say it is uh, using the neon electrode seems to be quite advantageous because we seem to get a much, much smaller surface dipole uh, as compared to having a free water surface, which means that we get a better equilibration. And we very carefully tested, you know, what would be the amount of the surface dipole and we can basically neglect it. And mostly what we sample in this uh, delta phi drop. So <laughs> basically here in the, oh, I need, I think to go here. So what we sample within this region here is the, potential drop that we get here at the interface. And this is due to the properties of this neon water interface. So we really tested it very carefully and this is negligible, the dipole contribution that you get here. So mostly we have what is, we are directly observing what is happening at this interface. It is just that when we want to compare to experiment, I think we still are missing a small part which we are currently working on hopefully getting soon. Yeah, by, by any means, I absolutely agree that uh, uh, it's a fantastic way to simulate the interface between, between uh, an electrolytic solution and charged interfaces. Uh, and of course, I mean, we are talking about uh, progress in science. So yeah. of course, I cannot do everything <laughs> with one so, article. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK. One part, and then there's still a few, several, <laughs> several others that you need to do. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, so th th thanks again. Um, is there any other question? We have here, uh, I mean, I I'm grateful to our audience who, uh, I mean, uh, stayed with us. Uh, I mean, uh, in spite of Frankel uh, talk uh, and the uh, second was uh, competing competing with us at an unfortunate competition and but uh, and, in, and in spite of the length of uh, the symposium. So I think that, uh, any other question? No? Okay, so if not, uh, I would thank, thank again uh, Mira and uh, our all our uh, uh, speakers uh, who gave a really nice overview of what is the state of the art in the uh, simulation uh, of uh, physics and chemistry of electrified interfaces. And on top of this, they were all women. So I'm very proud of this because uh, it's not uh, uh, common that 100% uh, of the speakers uh, in, uh, in, uh, is uh, in uh, scientific talks in general, in scientific symposia is uh, female. So thanks again and uh, see you next time next time hopefully in person <laughs> see you thanks thanks for organizing this thank thanks you. thanks <laughs>